All right, so let's talk a little bit about the Langstroth Hive. Now, I'll, I'll try to make a video later on when I get to thinking about it, about the, the top bar hive, because that is where I started. Uh, but since I have switched over to primarily Langstroth hives, um, just because they're, well, for one, for me, the switch came with them being more conducive of what I was doing. I started doing a lot of cutouts, uh, a lot of removal jobs, started wanting to make splits and do graphs and, and do a lot of stuff like that. And the top bar hives just aren't conducive to that. So we're going to talk about the Langstroth hive. The Langstroth hive, in its in its design, in its creation, and you guys are welcome to look up the history yourself of, of Mr. Langstroth and how he came across the design, but I'm going to just kind of breeze over it here on my understanding of the history, but basically Mr. Langstroth was a beekeeper and he was troubled by how when you got in a beehive, whatever you were using, a skep or whatever at the time, you had to always cause great damage to the hive to, to get in there and do an inspection or harvest honey or whatever. There wasn't a good way to to get in a hive and move things around, look at combs and you know diagnose issues and harvest honey. So he started really looking at that and started researching it and what he started looking at was feral colonies and how they built their hives. And he noticed how they pull all their combs perfectly parallel. Now not to say they're perfectly straight, but they're perfectly parallel at least the majority of the time. And there's always a minimum space between each comb. And that space is right about three-eighths of an inch. It might be a quarter, it might be a half, but usually right at three-eighths of an inch. And he coined the phrase bee space. And what that is, is that's the minimum space that the bees need to move throughout the hive and do the work they do. Other than that, they're gonna fill every cubic inch of that hive with comb so that they can store honey, so they can store pollen, uh, to make bee bread so they can lay brood, just whatever. But they're going to fill up every other bit of that hive space with comb. So he designed his hives around that and he designed the Langstroth frame such that when you put all the frames in the box and you put them all together snug, you're left with three-eighths of an inch between each frame. It makes great sense. But the other really important thing was that he designed the frame itself, the removable frame. And what you got with that now is course obviously you have a box full of frames and when you need to do a hive inspection you can get in there and pull out each and every individual frame you can flip it over you can look at both sides you can do what you need to do and you can put it right back in the hive and you might smash one or two bees but you haven't destroyed anything and that really revolutionized the beekeeping industry and to this day I mean that is the industry standard is the Langstroth hive so We'll cover a little bit more detail here on, on future videos as far as the components of the Langstroth Hive, but understanding the bee space and the necessity of the bee space that the Langstroth Hive was designed around, you really need to understand that you need to honor that and you need to, to stick with that bee space. Um, there's lots of things you can do with the Langstroth Hive. Obviously, the you know the original was, I'm just going to assume it was a 10 frame setup, it's 10 frames wide. Now there's people out there now, you know, the eight frames have become really popular. I think there's even a seven frame now that people like to run. I think over in uh, Europe, they maybe run 11 frames. Um, but the, you know, the point remains that you still have the removable frame inside. How many frames wide you want to go is up to you. Heck, I run a lot of five frames uh, and I like those a lot. So that doesn't matter. What matters is that you honor the B space. What I do not agree with is the use of a 10 frame box and you intentionally space your frames out to nine or even eight. And some people really like to do that. They think that, you know, it makes the bees draw combs a little bit deeper. Uh, so maybe you get a little bit more honey per comb and yeah, sure, sure you do. But if you're determined to do that, I would recommend do it in the honey supers only. Do it where you know they're never gonna lay any brew because otherwise, if you do it in your brood box, they're going to pull just that minimum depth combs that they need to lay the brood. And then at the top of the frame, they're gonna bulge it out and they're gonna make this goofy bulge at the top where they pack in the honey. So now you've got this odd size, odd size frame and you're gonna have this big gap, this inch gap possibly between the cappings on two brood combs. So now you've got an overspace and the bees are gonna to wanna to be filling that in with bridge comb and burr comb and everything else. But up top, you've got your honeys at that 3 eighths of an inch. Well, what if you decide you want to move some frames around and you want to add a ninth frame? 
you can't. You darn sure can't add 10th frame. You're going to smush everything together. You're going to make that comb smash right up against itself and you're going to violate bee space. Then you're going to create a minimal space or a space the bees can't get into. And then you're going to open yourself up to pests. So, you know, when I do my beekeeping classes and when I work with my own hives, I do my best never, ever, ever to violate bee space. Um, if you built a box to be a 10 frame box, put 10 frames in it. Come on. If you want a nine frame hive, build your box a little bit narrow and make it a nine frame, make it an eight frame, whatever you want to do. But you know, 150 years or more worth of success on the Langstroth hive designed around bee space. It, to me, it's foolish to ignore that now and say, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna try something different. You know, if you want to be my guest, but I do not recommend it. Um, the other thing that eats at me a lot is migratory covers. And we'll talk about the components of the hive, you know, inner cover, outer cover, migratory cover. Um, uh, what do they call the top covers on a wire? Either a, a cloth box or something like that. But, but again, a, a properly designed hive cover with the inner cover, outer cover, from the top of the frame to the lip of the box, you have one eighth of an inch. An inner cover is usually three quarters of an inch thick with a piece of quarter inch Luan plywood. And so that gives you quarter inch plywood, quarter inch either side. Well, quarter inch plus an eighth of an inch, three eighths of an inch. There's your B space. So that is really, that's the whole reason, in my opinion, for the inner cover. I know obviously it keeps the bees from gluing down your outer cover too. But to me, the importance of the inner cover is honoring that B space so the bees can get over top the frames if they need to. If you don't, if you're in an area that has small high beetles, guess what? You got an eighth of an inch there on top of that frame, and that is a beetle heaven. The bees can't get to them to pursue them, to try to, you know, get them out of the hive. So the beetles will all just pile up on top of those frames. Now, if you never take your hive cover off ever again, sure, the bees will seal that up with propolis, and uh, they'll trap those beetles. But the instant you pop that hive cover off, you just released all those beetles and let them go. Plus, what I, what I have happen that drives me nuts because I do have a couple migratory covers that I'm using only out of uh, necessity because I don't have enough inner outer cover pairs um, you go to pry that cover off and you pry up half your frames they're stuck they're glued to the bottom of it so that's a big pain in the butt too um, but yeah again I understand why people use migratory covers they're cheap they're easy and they do work uh, but they do violate B space if you want to use a flat cover build your own custom boxes and make it to where you have three-eighths of an inch between the top of your frame and the lip of the box and be my guest. I don't, you know, I, I don't despise you one bit for wanting to do that. So just, again, understand, understand why the hive is designed the way that it is. Understand why the components work the way they do. And hopefully that will lead you to understand why you shouldn't break the rules and do things differently. Um, I'm not saying that if you run a migratory cover, you're going to fail as a beekeeper. I'm not saying if you space your frames, you're going to fail, but you might run into issues that you're not going to be able to figure out or that are just going to be a complete pain in the butt for you to fix. And, you know, people call me and they tell me, yeah, I got this problem. Here's what's going on. And here's what I did. And if they tell me that they've openly violated bee space, I'm going to give you a hard time. I'm going to bust your chops for it. So, Again, this kind of goes back to the first video. Do your homework. Understand why and how things are the way they are. Number one thing to understand is that with a Langstroth hive and with beekeeping in general, you're asking a wild animal to, to work with you and work for you so you can get some honey, correct? So just understand what it is they need from you. Understand that they can just go off and build a hive in a tree and be just fine. They don't need you. So if you want them to stay in that box and you want them to thrive in that box, you have to know what it is they need and when because or else it, or else they're going to leave. They're going to abscond. They're not just going to kill off a swarm. If they don't like the way the box is being managed, if they feel they can't thrive in that box, they can't build a proper nest that they want, they're going to pack up and leave. And it's heartbreaking when you find that, I promise you. So, again... Do your research on the Langstroth Hive. Understand why it's built, how it's built. And, uh, you know, once you understand that, have fun and build your own. You know, I certainly encourage that. But, uh, yeah, just a little bit on Langstroth Hives, just so you all know. Um, 
kind of where we're getting started and I'll do a follow-up video on the individual components of the Langstroth Hive and why each one is designed uh, the way it is. We'll talk about a little bit about dimensions. Obviously if I'm doing this while I'm driving I'm not going to be able to show you guys any dimensions but um, you know check out my Facebook page uh, Bruggen's Bees that's B-R-U-E-G-G-E-N-S Bruggen's Bees uh, on Facebook. Um, obviously if you found these videos uh, the YouTube channel is named the same thing Bruggen's Bees my name is Tom Bruggen. I should have made that introduction on the first video. I'll make it um, when I do my introduction page on the video. But uh, yeah, plenty of resources out there. Hit me up. Shoot me an email. Hit me on Facebook. Hit me on YouTube. Comment on these videos. Whatever you want to do. Whatever you need to do to get your questions answered. But please do your homework before you ask a beginner question. It just it gets under my skin, and I don't want to get. I don't want to make people think I'm rude or that I'm arrogant. But you know, just. It's a two-way street. If you're going to be a successful beekeeper, you need to know what the bees need from you. You need to not be reliant upon always calling somebody else. Because if you have a panic situation, I don't answer my phone. What are you going to do? You got to figure it out. So know what you're getting into. For this video, know and understand the Langstroth box. If that's what you're doing, um, if that's what you're wanting to run, if you're running Langstroth hives, know and understand the hive. Understand why it's built the way it's built. Thank you.